Hello everyone, uh, this is my amazing friend Paul. We've known each other for years. We met uh, at a Hardy conference and have been firm friends since. He's a specialist in 19th century British literature, teaches at Texas A&M University, and uh, we share a birthday. So he's my brother from another mother and I'm his sister from another mister. And we swap presents every year because of it. So I would like to hand you over to the amazing Professor Paul Niemeyer. Well, I, I don't know if I can possibly live up to that. Um, <laughs> one thing I, I will say at the start, I'm, I'm actually on campus. I have a meeting later and so I'm in my own office and these walls are paper thin. So it's entirely possible uh, you may hear some strange voices that might be appropriate because this is a, a horror story if you hear these strange disembodied voices um, appearing. Uh, the main thing I'm, I'm afraid of is that a student will track me down and my phone will ring and um, I'm trying to hide from them. But this is the grim irony of it all, Dracula, cremation, and the business of burial. The obituary of Bram Stoker in the April 22nd, 1912 edition of the Times of London has long been an interesting piece of ephemera in Dracula studies. Biographies, literary monographs, and internet sites all talk of how Stoker's career as a novelist is restricted to a single dismissive sentence. He was the master of a particularly lurid and creepy kind of fiction represented by Dracula and other novels while the rest of the obituary practically fawns over Stoker's long career as personal manager to the actor Sir Henry Irving. No doubt the obituary has helped give rise to a view that at the time of the author's death, Dracula was either completely obscure or so notorious that to mention it violated all rules of decorum. In fact, the preface to a very recent edition of the novel blithely states, not a single newspaper obituary mentioned Dracula by name. Ironically, if the novel Dracula defined what was unacceptable by 1912 standards, something else in Stoker's obituary would have disturbed or even horrified many of Dracula's first readers just 15 years earlier. The simple closing down at the screen, the funeral is to take place quietly at Golders Green which was England's first and then only crematorium. During the years Stoker was researching and composing his novel, cremations were rare and were subject of legal arguments. They would become commonplace at the time that they would become commonplace at the time of his own death is largely owing to the work of the English Cremation Society, which publicized the dangers to the health of the living by the presence of those disease bearing dead bodies literally underfoot, a danger further exacerbated by the survivors of the dead, whose unreasoning sentiments cause them to fetishize the corpse itself to a point where they are reluctant to dispose of the departed in ways that are efficient, safe, and permanent. If these are not the same concerns of Bram Stoker and Dracula, they are certainly the concerns of vampire exterminator extraordinaire Abram van Helsing. The arguments of the Cremation Society, chiefly made through its de facto founder, Sir Henry Irving, were part of a larger mid-Victorian debate about the role played by cemeteries in that ever-present fear, the spread of disease. Starting in the 1830s, British cemetery grounds and churchyards were often characterized as being polluted with decomposing organic matter, which made them breeding grounds for fever. This fear inspired a national movement to build cleaner cemeteries on sanitary scientific principles. Kensal Green, with its carefully laid out plots and triple lined mausoleums, is one of the more obvious results and which challenged undertakers to devise new ways to limit the natural decomposition of the dead. Disease, next to sex, is probably the most popular trope used to interpret Dracula, but most studies of the novel tend to allegorize disease. Vampirism becomes a metaphor for cholera or syphilis, or even for the plague of foreigners and imperial nationals now invading the homeland. However, 
By reading the novel alongside Thompson's work advocating cremation of the dead, it can be seen that vampirism is not so much a way of allegorizing social threats posed by the dead. It is a direct charge that dead bodies themselves are true sources of disease and that people's insistence on denying the reality of death and preserving the illusion of life through elaborate preservation techniques and funerary rites results in life-threatening exposure to the dead. In fact, Thompson's argument that morticians cater to the sentiment of the survivor on behalf of preserving the beauty of form and expression of the dead body, even though after death, the condition of the body is a matter of utter indifference to the life tenant, is echoed in the novel by Van Helsing, whose recollection of the funeral of Lucy is laced with mockery. Oh, it was the grim irony of it all. This so lovely lady garlanded with flowers that looked so fair as life till one by one, we wondered if she was truly dead. That's an appropriate expression right there. She laid in that so fine marble house in that lonely churchyard where rest so many of her kin laid there with the mother who loved her and whom she loved and that sacred bell going toll, toll, toll so sad and slow and those holy men with the white garments of the angel pretending to read books and yet all the time their eyes never on the page and all of us with the bowed head and all for what? She is dead. Is it not? Of course, Lucy is now undead. And Van Helsing's sense of irony stems from his knowledge of this fact. But in his language, pointing to the fine marble house and to the performative nature of the religious, of the religious ceremony with holy men who only pretend to read sacred text, all for the benefit of memorializing an insensate subject Dracula engages in and even dramatizes the arguments of the cremation society. In this instance, Van Helsing serves as a kind of stand-in for Thompson, attacking the funeral industry's empty ornate trappings that distract from the reality and the horror of death. Later, Van Helsing will continue the work of the cremation society by affecting the disposal of the dead in a way that is practical, efficient, and asserves, assures permanent safety to the living, although on the surface, it too appears grotesque and even horrifying. The formation of the English Cremation Society was the almost inevitable result of two major movements during the Victorian era. The need to contain public contagion and the desire by the middle class to make funerals an expression of status. Victorians notoriously lived in almost pathological fear of outbreaks of disease, and with good reason. Yanni Skadura reports that the cholera epidemics of the 1830s brought public scrutiny onto old, crowded cemeteries in the midst of human habitation, which were judged to be ground zero for the spread of contagion. Decades later, the same fear marks Sir Henry Thompson's opening assault in his campaign against burying the dead. In his 1884 treatise, it is difficult not to see Thompson as anticipating not only Dracula, but such later zombie-themed entertainments such as The Walking Dead. Thompson intones, the process of decomposition affecting an animal body is one that has a disagreeable, injurious, often fatal influence on the living man if, it, if su sufficiently exposed to it. Thousands of human lives have been cut short by the poison of slowly decaying and often diseased animal matter. Even the putrefaction of some of the most insignificant animals has sufficed to destroy the noblest. To give an illustration which comes nearly home to some of us, the graveyard pollution of air and water alone has probably found a victim in some social circle known to more than one who may chance to read this paper. 
and I need hardly add that in times of pestilence, its continuance has been often due mainly to the poisonous influence of the buried victims. As documented by John Morley in 1971, Thompson had seen the model of an Italian crematory apparatus at the 1873 Vienna exhibition. And this convinced him of the efficacy and practicality of cremation over the traditional means of burial. Thompson's article on the subject, Cremation, the Treatment of the Body After Death, published in the Contemporary Review of January 1874, was favorably received and led him to be a founding memory of, member of the Cremation Society of England, its charter members being such luminaries as Tenniel, Malays, Trollope, Charles Voicy, and Thomas Spencer Wells. Thompson's article and his follow-up to an anti-cremation critique would be published in pamphlet form later in the 1870s, and these documents would be bundled with other works on cremation into a booklet that would go through different editions through the, throughout the 1880s, when cremation was still technically illegal in Britain, as it would be until 1902. Whether Stoker read Thompson's works or even knew of them apparently cannot be shown, but is immaterial. The issues surrounding burial or cremation had enough cultural cachet that Thompson's arguments might have been familiar to Stoker or to any well-read Londoner. Quite inadvertently, in arguing against the dangers posed by the decomposition process in dead matter to living people, Thompson ends up characterizing the dead as malicious. Thompson's favorite term is mischievous entities hiding out in cemeteries and waiting to strike out against future generations. Thompson's fears take on Malthusian tones in his images of cemeteries and growing suburbs competing for the same space. And in his vision, it is the inhabitants of the cemeteries that will be triumphant. He writes, at present, we who dwell in towns are able to escape much evil by selecting a portion of ground some five or 10 miles from any very populous neighborhood and by sending our dead to be buried there. Laying by poison, nevertheless, it is certain for our children's children who will find our remains polluted by water sources when that now distant plot is covered as it will be more or less closely by human dwellings. Thompson, of course, was not envisioning the dead being restored to a form of life and then attacking the living. To the contrary, his interest is entirely in the destructive microbes that begin their work once life leaves the body, creating a process Thompson claims, as we have seen, is one that has a fatal influence on the living men if sufficiently exposed to it. Internment, Thompson argues, is a notoriously unsafe means of disposing of the poisonously decomposing dead. The pollution of wells and streams which supply the living, he declares, must ere long arise wherever we bury our dead in this country. Thompson confesses that it is quite possible that the bodies now buried may have lost most, if not all, of their faculty for doing mischief by the time that the particular soil they inhabit is turned up again to the sun's rays, but the margin of safety as to time grows narrower year by year. Thompson's vision of neighborhoods moving closer to and even being built over cemeteries, thus allowing the mischievous dead to poison future generations, is effectively reversed in the plans of the mischievous undead Count Dracula, who moves to England to expose the present and future generations to his deathly disease and to effectively allow the cemeteries to take over the neighborhoods. As the horrified Jonathan Harker expresses, this was the being I was helping to transfer to London, where perhaps for centuries to come, he might, amongst its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever-widening circle of semi-demons to batten on the helpless. Dracula's first victim to become such a semi-demon, Lucy, preys exclusively on children, 
furthering the idea that Dracula is contaminating the future. Moreover, Dracula's protean nature is appearing in the novel first as an old man and then becoming, through parasitic consumption of human blood, a younger one, and his transformations into the forms of wolf and bat even suggest that he is not so much the carrier of disease, but the disease itself. He is the transforming, mutating virus that enters living substances and either alters them or destroys them. First time readers of the novel, especially those who come to it after having seen one of the many films or television adaptations, are often disappointed by the few appearances that Dracula makes in the novel that bears his name. But in fact, he is always present. Like the disease dead, he is out of sight, but always performing deadly mischief. It is in the bizarre, at times comical events surrounding Lucy's illness and death, and in the subsequent events to expose and destroy Dracula, that Stoker's novel most shows an engagement with the issues surrounding the cremation debate and especially with Thompson's arguments about the role of unnecessarily ritualistic funerals in making people insist on burial. Thompson locates the insistence on interment to a cultural attachment to the idea that the moment of death is one of transcendent beauty for the victim and that survivors wish both to preserve that beauty in the dead body and to hide from themselves the knowledge that this beauty will soon give way to corruption. In chapter 12 of Dracula, Dr. Seward reports that in the moment of life leaving Lucy's body, death had given back part of her beauty, for her brow and cheeks had recovered some of their flowing lines. Even the lips had lost their deadly pallor. It was as if the blood no longer needed for the working of the heart had gone to make the harshness of death as little rude as it might be. For good measure, Seward throws in two lines from Thomas Hood's poem, The Deathbed, which blurs the difference between sleeping and death. But Seward could have just as well cited passages from other works involving beautiful deaths, most notably from Dickens. In The Old Curiosity Shop, 1841, the end of Little Nell is rhapsodized in the lines. She was dead, no sleep so beautiful and calm, so free from trace of pain, so fair to look upon. She seemed a creature fresh from the hand of God and waiting for the breath of life, not one who had lived and suffered death. And David Copperfield, hovering over the deathbed of his angelic bride, Dora, is fixated by what would be the central object in the most common of mem mementos mori for the Victorians, her hair. It is morning and Dora made so trim by my aunt's ha hands shows me how pretty her hair will curl upon the pillow yet and how long and bright it is and how she likes to have it loosely gathered in that net she wears. Dickens's heroines are not disfigured by the approach and arrival of death. They are made more beautiful, and the moment of death tends to eternalize that beauty. Deborah Lutz identifies this focus on the body as part of what she calls Victorian death culture, which is largely located on the, material out, the, on the material, materiality, I'm sorry, I can't talk, um, of the corpse itself and all it came in contact with. She writes, the dead body's materiality held a certain enchantment for Victorians, a charmed ability to originate narrative, bodies left behind traces of themselves, shreds that could then become material for memories. Such vestiges might be found in objects the body had touched as it advanced through existence. Corporeality, for many Victorians, lent the resonance of subjectivity to objects, laded them with leavings of the self. Death, then, actually makes life more real. The body and its relics 
acted as a kind of doorway to the whole of a past life. It made it material, tangible, able to be held and represented. The remains of the loved one's body represented the endless meaning of a being in motion. Again, that's from Lutz. But Thompson bluntly counters this thinking by arguing that the only motion of the corpse is in the horrible work of decomposition that sets in at the moment of death, and that by burying it away, people only hide from themselves the sight of decomposition at work. A glimpse of the reality which we achieve by burial, he says, would annihilate in an instant every sentiment for continuing that process. Nay, more, it would arouse a powerful repugnance to the horrible notion that we too must someday become so vile and offensive and as, and as it may be, so dangerous. Catering, in this sense literally, to the desire to preserve the beauty and obtained at the moment of death is the undertaker, a figure who in the 19th century, as Yanis Kadura notes, held an ambiguous uh, position. Undertakers were traitors in death. At the time of Dracula's composition, they were also involved in a bid to be seen as professionals rather than as those providing an unsavory, if necessary, service. However, society remained biased against such figures. In Dracula, Seward again is the voice of distrust. Following Lucy's death, he records, I attended to all the ghastly formalities and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff were afflicted or blessed with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me in a confidential brother professional way when she had come out from the death chamber, she makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. Scandura considers this scene where arrangements for Lucy's funeral are made to be highly theatrical, which it is, and she charges that Seward considers the female attendant's tone of brother professionalism to be cross-gendered behavior. But beyond this, the attendant's tone suggests that the undertaker now views his work as on the same level as a physician's. Indeed, Scandura also argues that the late Victorian undertaker would that the also argues that the late Victorian undertaker would begin to associate his work with that of the man of medicine. She writes, exploiting Victorian fears of decomposing corpses and unsanitary graveyards. Embalmer suggested that they, like doctors, could protect the living from disease by permanently halting the dangerous process of decomposition. Cynical towards undertakers as he is, Seward still cannot help but praise them when he beholds Lucy's treated body. The undertaker had certainly done his work well, and death was made as little repulsive as it might be. He continues, all Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death and the hours that passed instead of leaving traces of decays of facing fingers had but restored the beauty of life till positively I could not believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. Seward will largely re repeat his words when he again beholds Lucy's body this time after he and Van Helsing break into her tomb. There lay Lucy, seemingly just as we had seen her the night before her She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe she was dead. The lips were red, nay, redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. Of course, Lucy's lips Lucy's lips are red from feeding on the blood of innocent children. Seward's appreciation of the beauty of the corpse, laced with language evocative of Ernest Dowston's Sinara, now takes on the aspect of parody. Lucy is, in fact, a dead body. 
one that through the supernatural powers of vampirism mixed with the cosmetic arts of the undertaker lend her a grotesque semblance of life. Like the children who see her artificial beauty and dub her the blue fur lady, both Seward and Lord Arthur Holmwood are in danger. Van Helsing must caution them both against mistaking the painted dead for a living woman. The Undertaker's art was actually an expensive one. And this serves as another area of criticism for Henry Thompson in his crusade for cremation. Thompson conservatively estimates the annual cost of funerals to Londoners in 1874 as 800,000 pounds, all lost in such expenditures as shroud, coffin, labor of digging a grave, funeral carriages, horses, trappings, and accoutrements, vaults and monumental art, more or less employed in all funerals above the rank of pauper. Many, stu many studies have described the elaborate trappings of the proper Victorian funeral, not just for the upper classes, but even for the middle class. Scandura shows that by the 1870s, a top flight funeral for the bourgeoisie would feature expensive coffins with silver nails, satin linings and brass fixtures, horses decorated with ostrich plumes to drive the hearse, hundreds of yards of black crepe, velvet and silk, all of this amounting to a spectacle in which the mourners paid the undertaker and his assistants to perform their own expected sensations of loss. Pat Jaland, however, reports that by 1894, costs of funerals had been reduced and the desire for good taste was achieved. A good funeral could be had for 10 to 15 pounds. These figures, however, do not include expenditures on a process related to the funeral, that of mourning the dead. One of the areas of Victoriana that is most bizarre to our eyes is the highly ritualized art of mourning, prescribed periods in which the dead are to be remembered, types of clothes to be worn, even jewelry to be worn and distributed. These needs were satisfied through mourning warehouses. In London, two were located on Regent Street that sold proper mourning attire in crepe for men and women, memorial jewelry, and even ear trumpets in black for the hard of hearing. In short, funerals were big business in Victorian England, not just the burial of the dead, but the process of remembering the dead through costly accoutrements and rel um, reliquaries. The saturation of death with money is seen in the wealth of Dracula himself. This is made clear early in the novel in Jonathan Harker's description of the decorations in Dracula's Transylvania castle, which strike him as impressive, but out of sorts. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are around me. The table service is of gold and so beautifully wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics and must have been of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. The description of a scene of luxurious beauty laid out to impress a living man who is in the castle to deal with the living dead is evocative of the interior decorating performed by the undertaker, or more correctly here, funeral director, in preparing rooms for the preparation of the body, or even in the decor of the funeral parlor itself. The castle is famously empty of mirrors. Stoker's one undisputed contribution to vampire lore is the inability of the vampire to see itself in the mirror. But this element may owe less to the medieval tradition of preventing souls from being trapped in mirrors than to the simple fact that in Victorian funeral displays, mirrors were traditionally covered or simply removed. Following the destruction of Lucy's animated corpse, which indeed restores her face of unequaled sweetness and purity, yet tellingly leaves it with the realistic traces of care and pain 
and waste artfully hidden by the undertaker's art and Dracula's more sinister operations, the novel chronicles the crusade to expose and destroy Dracula himself. In some respects, Van Helsing's efforts are similar to those of Henry Thompson and his followers in advocating cremation. The first critique of Thompson's work was made by a Mr. Holland, the medical inspector of burials for England and Wales, who suggested that cremation itself posed a hazard to the lungs, never mind the constant state of pollution or fog that is synonymous with major cities in Victorian England. Stronger foes, however, were in the Church of England and especially in the growing funeral industry, both of which detected in cremation a threat to their own monopolies and services for the dead. Significantly, Van Helsing's crusade is one that is as financial as it is religious. In addition to decontaminating and eradicating the evidence of Dracula's funerary art, the perfectly preserved corpses and the polluted earth that holds them, the crusaders realized the necessity of bankrupting Dracula to take away his foothold in England. Immediately after Jonathan realizes their seemingly hopeless task is in the hands of God, Mina, herself on the verge of transforming into a vampire, records her appreciation of the wonderful power of money. What can it not do when it is properly applied? And what might it do when it is basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich and that both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our little expedition could not start, either so promptly or so well equipped as it will within another hour. The seeming endless supply of cash from England's nobility and American capitalism are among the modern forces that defeat the sentimental power of Dracula to preserve the mischievous dead. The final unnamed foe, which both Henry Thompson and Abram Van Helsing face, is popular consciousness. Opposition to cremation was not entirely a result of bad publicity put out by church and morticians. There was a lingering attachment to the Christian tenet of the need for an intact body for resurrection, and a cultural and literary history that made cremation into a foreign, decidedly exotic, and possibly barbaric practice. Lurid newspaper reports discussed Indian widows committing sati, throwing themselves on the blazing funeral pyres of their husbands, which was ended by the British army, spurred on by outraged Christians at home. Other readers might again find reference in Dickens, whose 1853 novel Bleak House contains the grand guignol scene of a conversation between gentlemen being interrupted by the fluttering down of greasy black flakes, which turn out to be the remains of Crook, who dies by spontaneous combustion. Lastly, there is the case of Louis-Edouard Fournier's famous and colossally inaccurate painting, The Funeral of Shelley. Though an undeniably beautiful painting, it also makes cremation into something otherworldly. The figures are separate from the pyre, remote, and Byron tellingly, does not seem to be mentally in the picture. It is an isolated, anti-social ending for a poet who always lived against societal norms. If cremation was thought to be foreign or barbaric, Henry Thompson did not shirk in his belief that it offered a clean and efficient solution to a modern problem. Similarly, Van Helsing's toolkit, which contains such homely items of equipment as a soldering iron, oil lamp, knives, and most famously, a pointed wooden stake and a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps, represents the appropriation of the crude for cleanly and efficiently dispatching a modern sanitary problem. Thompson's blunt scientific language is again echoed in the words of Van Helsing, who clearly states what must be done to neutralize Lucy. I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. Like Thompson, 
Van Helsing urges his followers to look past the prejudices of modern times and to see the cleaner values of an earlier and more efficient way of disposing of the mischievous dead. Significantly, as Elizabeth Hotz observes, when Dracula and his brides are finally destroyed, they crumble into elemental, elemental particles, effectively into cremains. In the novel Dracula, as in the arguments of Victorian cremationists, the dead indeed are dangerous things. And the danger is only spread by the ritual of the showy and expensive funeral. The only cure for a mischievous vampire or for a mischievous deteriorating corpse, both of which threaten the future health and stability is the security of a purifying flame. And that ends my presentation.